Good evening, one and all present here. We are honored to have with us Mr. S. Sundaresh for today's lectureship lecture, leadership lecture. So, Mr. S. Sundi Sundaresh has a B.Tech degree in Electrical Engineering from IIT Madras in the year 1978 and has a master's degree in electrical engineering from Cornell University in the year 1979 and also an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania in 1983. So, Mr. S. Sundi Sundaresh is the president and CEO of Zangati Inc., an enterprise infrastructure software company. He is a well-known technology executive with a proven track record. Sundi has served in various capacities as CEO, general manager, board member, and senior executive at top companies. He is also the co-founder of IIT Ma NA Bay Area chapter and has, and, and has been the speaker, moderator, panelist at various IIT Madras and Pan IIT events in the US. He also serves on the boards of Pan IIT USA and Pratham USA, the Bay Area chapter a non-profit focused on primary education for your underprivileged children. So, now I invite him to take over the dais for today's lecture. Thank you all. That's, can everybody hear me? Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the few times uh, I was in auditoriums like this on this campus, I was usually on the other side. So, it uh, feels weird and it feels an honor to be here addressing you and sharing my experiences. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is walk you through what I've gone through since my IIT days and distill some lessons. And what's most important is that this be as interactive as possible. So, so I'll give you some nuggets in terms of what I've learned. Chances are most of it will be irrelevant for you because it's stuff I've learned over the last 30 years and technology has changed and the world has changed. And some of those may not apply in the Indian context because the dynamic of the growth in India is very different from what's happening in, in the US. So with that as a grain of, take that as a caveat, but through the question and answer and the interactions, I'm sure we'll get to some ideas on what life is outside IIT. And I call this life in the technology lane but because I stuck with a technology industry career, not necessarily an engineering career. But the excitement I had coming into IIT and getting a degree here and being part of engineering and being part of a technology product group and companies uh, stayed with me all through my life to date. And so the companies I chose were all in related fields. So to give you a snapshot, my professional life uh, since IIT, and it's, it's, when I started putting this picture together, uh, it fell in place in a remarkable way. The first third of my career actually ended up in large companies, billion dollar plus companies, uh, all hardware related, systems, computer systems, uh, PCs, development systems, etc. So these were all large companies. Uh, all of the jobs were in the Bay Area in California, and that was a third. The next third split between two different sessions uh, were at Adaptech, and Adaptech is a mid sized company. So I played two different roles in that company, and it went from 100 odd million in revenue all the way to a billion, and then back down in a different era. But collectively, I spent a third of my career in, in a mid sized company role and saw the dynamics of that. And lastly, the next third of my career were in startups, uh, zero to 100 million in revenue. And, and I broke them in, in two categories. Uh, Jetstream, Candera, Sandforce were all hardware. And so if you look at this picture, what you'll notice is the bulk of my engagement has been with hardware companies. And that fits with a double E electronics degree that I got from IIT Madras. The last three, and all of those happened just in the last two and a half to three years are in software. So in a, in a way, I have remade myself because that's where the industry is going and that's where the opportunities are and that's where I was invited to come in and help. And one of the interesting things you learn as you go through these things is the things we learn at IIT aren't specific to a domain or a technology. It's about broad-based problem solving. It's about uh, learning to deal with pressure 
and it is about uh, tackling problems that uh, you did not always know you could, but you learned to do that with the help of those around you. So, those skills apply beyond just a specific domain or area you learn about. If you take a cut differently, uh, the first thing I went into was an engineering career. And in fact, if you had asked me when I left IIT what I would be doing, I would have said, I'm going to spend a lifelong career in engineering in a technology company. That was my dream. And in fact, my dream company at the time was Hewlett Packard. And had nothing to do with anything other than in our labs those instruments are the only ones that worked consistently all the time. I said, if there's a company that can deliver such good products, I want to be part of it. So when I left India, went in, got my master's, that's what I wanted to do. Spend my life in engineering at Hewlett Packard. And as you saw in the previous chart, life didn't quite turn out that way. So you had a lot of twists and turns, ended up in a number of companies. I spent a fair amount of time at Hewlett Packard, but not all. But the other interesting thing that happened was I went beyond engineering. It is not something I would have predicted in 1978. Uh, I actually went after a few years in engineering and got an MBA and then went back into roles in product management, operations planning, marketing and general management, again with technology companies, but it was a switch looking at the other side of the function and how companies develop, evolve, and launch, launch products. And uh, those were lessons about how products come to market. Uh, so I had some naive notions about what engineers did and what, how products came to market, and the reality wasn't quite that. Uh, you had to interact with others. Uh, sales had a role, marketing had a role, and most important, the customer had a role. So if you understand, did not understand what the customer wanted, everything we did in the labs were quite irrelevant. So it actually led me to, to seek an MBA. It's kind of ironic because when I was in IIT, my dad was trying to get me to do an MBA and I kept refusing. And then I went and did it myself. Uh, the other twist, and this goes to wonderful planning and happenstance that happens in life, production planning, control, and logistics. Never in my wildest dreams at IIT or even after did I think or did I want to do anything on a production floor or an operations floor? And, and yet, circumstances led me there. Uh, I was at HP. They transferred me to a role in Puerto Rico to actually run a piece of marketing. But the wonderful dynamics of large companies, things reorganized, different things happen. So I transferred. My wife and I went to Puerto Rico, which is a beautiful Caribbean island. And six months into my job, they said, oh, by the way, we changed our mind. This is no longer going to be a division. This is only going to be a manufacturing center. So you have a choice. You can find a way to come back, or you can take a role in production planning and control. And so I took that. I said, OK, I'm here. I love this island. Uh, what's not to like about spending a couple of years in the Caribbean and traveling around? So I did a stint in production planning and control. It was a little bit of a step away from where I wanted to be in terms of product management and marketing around developing core products. It was a new experience that on my own I would never have planned, but due to circumstances it happened. And the funny thing was years later what I did there helped as I started building organizations when I was CEO of companies. So things have a way of working out when at the moment it never seemed that way. And all of these areas, if you look at it from engineering to general management, that was the first half of my career. The second half ended up being CEOs of startups, mid-sized company, and now back again to startups and the board of several startups. So that's kind of how the, the career has been split. And if I were to net it out, I'm going to walk you through some of the technology elements, and then we'll talk about lessons learned and what I got out of it. So my technology experience, again, primarily hardware-centric, started in semiconductors and development systems, then computing systems, and then storage subsystems. And so they were all varied. So I wasn't particular. To me, just being around technology was fun enough that I wasn't particular about it. It had to be this particular slice 
of technology. As long as it was in the general realm, the problem was interesting, it was something exciting to tackle, and the company was nice, I was, I was fine to go with it. The next group were really startups, and they were all over. Telecom systems, you scratch your head and go, how did somebody doing computing and storage end up in telecom? And frankly, I don't know myself, other than when I was working in a storage company, a recruiter called me and said, there's a startup, uh, that's got an interesting problem and they're looking for a CEO, would you be willing to consider it? And I said, why not? And I went and interviewed, next thing I know I got the job and suddenly I was in a very different field. Now, this may not apply to everybody's personality but uh, I have this tendency to want to, jump, want to jump into things where there's an opportunity to learn, where there's an opportunity to do something different and new because that keeps me energized and and keeps me challenged and learning. So as long as your broad-based skills are there, you can apply it to new areas. They're usually things you don't know, and so you don't fall into the complacency of assumptions. That I know, I, I've been in this long enough that I know what to do so you don't question things. And if things change, you miss them. But when you go into new areas, there's no room for complacency. You just don't know, which means you go in, engage, ask a lot of questions, which is a key part of running any organization is more about the right questions than about knowing the answers. Because people around you know the answers. And so I ended up in telecom. It was a very interesting, fun startup. They did a couple of others. And then eventually the last three, as I said, are in very current areas, storage software around disaster recovery services in the cloud, in-memory computing, the whole area of as you scale, compute, and have these large data centers and are crunching a lot of numbers, going back and forth to disk drives really slows things down. And, and you can't support the level of compute needed. So now you do all of these in memory. So there are companies there trying to do these things and helping applications run in memory. It's one I'm involved in. And the last one is what I'm running right now, which is an enterprise infrastructure performance analytics for companies running data centers and private or public clouds. So all software related, but the fundamental issues are really the same. What is the value? Who is the customer? How are we doing the development? How are we making sure that the right features are in the product to support our customers? So the nature of questions are all very similar across these. To put this in context, if you look at technology and it changes, and this is in the context of uh, the, what I'd call the electronics computer science realm. About every decade, there's a new wave. Semiconductors in the mid 70s to the 80s, the personal computers in the 80s and early 90s. Networking hit in the beginning of the 90s, and that drove servers, and that drove storage in terms of shared media. Internet came along, social media is the next wave, and now we talk about cloud, mobile, big data, analytics, etc. You go back and look at these, the best opportunities come when you're in that wave and riding that growth. And, and if your company is part of an ecosystem that's in that wave, things go very well. And if not, they don't. And if you reflect back on things I've done, not that I did these consciously, I'm kind of going back and saying, okay, here's, here's what happened. There were two waves I missed completely. None of the companies I was in were really involved in the internet wave. That became a software era, if you will, or the social media one. Now, it's coming back in that the infrastructure needed to drive all of these is back to what's happening in the data center, and that's where the enterprise infrastructure software comes in, which is my involvement again in the cloud and analytics space. Okay. But the, the takeaway for all of you is look at the areas, look at where the growth is, and if you have good companies, good products in areas of growth, there are plenty of opportunities. If you try to fight the tide, if you go against that, uh, even the best companies really struggle. So change in technology is the only constant. You know, the 30 years that I've been in, we've walked you through about five different waves. Uh, I've been part of at least three of them. 
but you have to learn to deal with that. High growth and rapid obsolescence. Things disappear. The things we used to take for granted as products aren't there. Companies aren't there. Companies that were leaders in their heyday uh, no longer exist or are part of something else. Uh, when uh, in the early 80s, when I was at Hewlett Packard, I had friends at Sun Microsystems. Today, Sun isn't even an in independent company. It's part of Oracle. Today's world, Facebook didn't even exist back then, or WhatsApp didn't. Well, WhatsApp is no longer an independent company. So these waves go, they get absorbed, things change. So you have to be prepared to learn to deal with the growth challenges, the rapid obsolescence challenges, and can you as a company or can you as an individual adapting to the skills needed be ready to move and adapt yourself? So adaptability is key in this industry. You can't be resting on your laurels of here's what I've learned in the 2013-14 period. It will still apply 10, 15, 20 years later. One of the other interesting things in technology is how you create barriers. So you see lots of companies, there are some that become huge giants, and there are some that are small that ride the wave, and then they disappear. If you look at the ones that are huge giants, invariably you'll find at the heart of their initial growth, they very rapidly got architectural control or through positive network effects created a significant barrier to entry. And, and what do I mean by that? Uh, you take somebody like Intel, pretty much every PC, X, every PC over the last 30 years have been built on an x86 architecture. That means they have architectural control on that. All of the developed software runs on it. So there's a positive network effect of developers piling in, OSs piling in. And so they're at the heart of that, gives them a distinct advantage in that environment. And they've been able to use that to build a very profitable business over many years. Uh, you look at somebody like Facebook. They built a network effect by connecting. So it's a very rich infrastructure now because all of your friends and all of your family and everybody else is connected. So it's very hard to disconnect away from Facebook because the network effect gives you so much more power uh, than some individual products. So their staying power is a lot longer. WhatsApp got valued in, what was that, 19 billion or something, again, because of that positive network effect. Outside of that, there are a lot of other smaller companies that ride in the ecosystem of that. They're supporting something within that environment. Uh, one of the companies I was involved in was Adaptec. Uh, they used to make storage I.O. controllers. And on servers, they had that positive network effect. Because they had the best support for that protocol, all of the developers, all of the peripheral devices, disk drives, CD-ROM, scanners, everybody supported the Adaptec SCSI protocol that made them the de facto leader. It became very hard for other companies to come in and break that. The only time companies get in to break that is when something fundamentally different happens with a whole new protocol. So in the case of Intel, for example, as they're trying to get into the mobile space, very different area. They don't have the processor dominance in mobile the way they have on PCs and laptops. Or in the case of Adaptec, when the industry standard moved from SCSI to something else, along the way to fiber channel and SAS, they didn't make that transition. So technology companies always have this challenge of making the transition when something new comes along, because so much of their internal processes, systems, et cetera, are vested in the old world. And so it creates a barrier to entry. It also creates a barrier to exit. And when that happens, those big companies struggle. So the opportunity for us as individuals or as companies is to say, okay, can we create the wave? Can we find that niche or find that unique opportunity where the business itself can be built and become huge? Or do we ride that? Do we become part of that ecosystem where we are getting dragged along as, as Intel sells servers, Adaptex sells more I.O. controllers, or as... Uh, Google has an app engine. Everybody else who's riding on that uh, also gets to make money, et cetera. And finally, one of the most important things in, in technology isn't about technology at all. It's customers. 
and, and customers buy solutions and this is an important point. Uh, I was definitely naive about it in my early days where I thought if I do something cool and build something great in the lab, uh, that's all that's needed and we had a great working product. But the customer's idea of product is often different from our idea of product. Uh, we look at a gadget and say it's a product. The customer's idea of the product includes the support, it includes uh, the experience they have, it includes the apps that run on it. So their experience isn't just tied to the hardware or the software, it's, it's all of them. And that's why I put that in quotes. It's the whole product, is the whole solution experience that the customer buys or wants to buy. And, and that's what determines whether you are successful or not. And one of the best examples here is, is Apple. Uh, it's almost, I forget when they launched this, but I, I saw the other day that the iPod Classic is actually being discontinued because they can't find enough parts for it anymore. But when they launched the iPod, iPod there, was, uh, there were MP3 players out there. There were lots of MP3 players out there, but they were products. And what Apple created was an experience. They tied an MP3 player with the iTunes experience, with the ergonomic design. So what you got was a, a collective experience that made it very unique. And that's why they were incredibly successful with that product when all the other MP3 players went by the wayside. So it comes back to what we do has to be done in the context of, of customers. And, and the customer's decision making involves a lot more than our little piece. It involves applications, it involves support, sometimes it involves even the channel, who are they buying it from? Because they have preferences and that may have a factor, that may influence how you design your products because it also needs to suit the, the partners they buy from. So those are some of the quick takeaways because we have barely an hour and I want to make sure there's enough time for Q&A. And so I want to give you a couple of other nuggets on, on entrepreneurship. And I've noticed in the lecture series there have been several others who spent a lot of time on this. So I'm going to just dwell on a couple of areas. What makes a high potential startup? And I should caveat all of this in the context of uh, raising venture capital. If you're not raising venture capital, these things don't apply. But if you're raising venture capital, that means you're looking to someone to finance the growth of your startup. And these things are important. Is the problem compelling? And, and what I mean by that is for the customer, are you solving something in such a way that they have to have it? It's not, oh, it's nice. I'll think about it two months from now. No, this is so great. I need to have it now. That, that must have feeling has to come in, that you're solving a compelling enough problem that they perceive. So, so they want to get that product. Because startups have enough challenges that if, if you don't have the draw from customers and you have to convince everybody every time, the, the time and the resource and the ability it takes to scale these things uh, enormous, makes it very difficult. Differentiated solution. Uh, this goes without saying in, in any company with any product, but when you're in a large company, you can get by. You have enough resource and you have enough of a a relationship with the customer across a broad portfolio of products that you can sell a me too product you can sell something even if you're number three number four in market share you may not make a lot of money but you can still sell it if you're a startup you have to make sure what you're offering is differentiated it's different enough in a dramatic way to get people's attention and and the common rule of thumb is 10x improvement in performance or 10x reduction in cost or 10x change in some user experience etc. So if it's dramatic enough, that's truly differentiated. Now you have something to go with. So you got a product set, you lowered the risk on whether the customer will get it, you lowered the risk on whether competition will come in. Is the opportunity large? And, and why is that important? From the venture capitalist perspective, anytime you start something, there are a lot of unknowns and chances are a bunch of bright people will go in with some assumptions. They'll drive the product in a certain direction as they validate, talk to customers, new data points come in, and you have to go in a different direction. Within the same broad space, so if the market is large enough, then different slices and segments are available and possible. <coughs> if it's not, then 
you're stuck. So the typical venture capitalist wants to make sure that the market is large enough, knowing that somewhere along the way you're going to do some zigzagging and they just want to make be comfortable that when you do the zigzag, the market's still there for you. You need a passionate, energetic founder or leader. So many things can go wrong. You can go back dejected. You have to have someone who has absolute conviction that the idea they have, the solution they have is, is a killer. It, it really solves a problem. And they've got to champion that day in, day out, and, and be that uh, flag-waving person inside a company. That's really critical because lots of things can go wrong in a startup, and you need that person to rally the troops day in, day out. And the last one is a solid team. You know, as much as uh, a few key people have the ideas, those ideas get executed when they surround themselves by a solid team. And in fact, in the beginning, when you think about this, the product is an idea. Uh, it's still not validated that the customer solution, if it's compelling for the customer or it's differentiated. So when a VC looks at you, he's really looking at only two things. Who's that founder? How, how much conviction do they have in the idea? And what's the core team they have built? Often the early bets are made just on that because there are a lot of unknowns on the others. And they'll make subsequent bets as more data is available, but the core bet is around the founder and the team. Now, subsequent financings can be on the other factors, but if you have those, then there's no guarantee, but you have that potential for a high, high performance startup. So what does it mean in terms of creating value? What does value creation in a startup mean? You go through stages. In the early stage, it's an idea. Somebody tells you it's worth X million. You go back after making some progress. Now they tell you it's 2X million, et cetera. So you're slowly building value. And, and contrary to the notion that startups are risky, uh, the reality is in startup, all the effort is about reducing the risk. Okay? It's, it's, Counterintuitive, and it may come across like a paradox, but that is the case. The, the founders have the conviction. So the rest of us looking at it from the outside think, oh my God, they're taking a big risk. But what the founder has is that unique insight. Having talked to a number of customers in whatever job they've had before or looking at things or surveying the market, they've developed some unique insights about that customer, about that market. That, that knowledge is unique to them. So when they're pursuing it, they're not really taking a risk. They have absolute conviction that this is a real solid uh, opportunity. And that customer intimacy that they have reduces the adoption risk. So somebody from the outside may not know that. They may think, oh my God, what are these guys doing? I didn't even know there was a market for this and they're taking a huge risk. The reality is they're not. They've engaged with enough customers that that customer adoption risk from their perspective is low because they've had those conversations. They assemble a diverse team. Often in these startups, it's not everybody from the same discipline. You know, uh, one of the startups I was involved in, actually all of the startups, is people from different places. So in the, in the telecom startup, <coughs> the founder was a guy from the networking industry. So just as telecom was moving from voice-based circuits to voice over IP, or this predates voice over IP, but at least to packet-based technologies, people in the networking industry understood packet technologies. They didn't understand voice. This guy was, had the, the conviction after having been in that industry for a while about how he could deliver voice over ATM. And he actually ended up, which stands for asynchronous transfer mode, which is a technology that predates IP. But he used that and assembled a bunch of people from networking and voice segments to really come in with a product that carriers loved. Another startup was doing uh, storage. But again, the founder came from networking. So that means he applied techniques that came from the networking industry to a storage problem. The typical storage industry guys never thought about that, never thought about applying a particular networking approach to storage. And those types of things. Uh, bring new ideas, new approaches, and that innovation often happens when you bring a diverse group, different modes of thinking, 
assemble them together and they create differentiated solutions and barriers to entry. Fast development and prototyping. One of the biggest risks in startups is the technology risk. You, you spend a long time developing something and in software this is less true because software can turn much faster. Uh, but in hardware this is always an issue. You had long cycles. So you spent a lot of money only to find at the back end that something didn't work or the chip was wrong or you have to go back and start the cycle all over again. Millions of dollars. In fact, that's why today a lot of hardware startups don't get off the ground. VCs don't want to touch them because they don't want to take that technology risk. But if you can find, whether it's hardware or software or any other business you're in, if you can find ways to do the development in rapid cycles, do rapid prototyping, so you can bring that technology risk down, you can quickly show working prototypes, social early demonstrations with customers, etc. That lowers the technology risk. And then you assemble, then when you're ready with that product, now you got some early customers, scaling that business requires more than founders and the initial team. You want to assemble the set of people who know how to scale a business as it grows. Because growth has its own challenges, and the people who are good at one stage aren't always good at the next stage. You have exceptions. You have people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, etc., who started with the company at the beginning and took it through billions of dollars. Most startups don't work that way. At some point, the, you need to assemble other people to help drive the scale in the business. And that helps bring the execution risk down on if you're growing 100%, 200%, do you have the people who know how to bring the systems, processes, controls, and make sure the quality isn't compromised, etc. And the last one is partner ecosystem. You know, we can't do everything ourselves. You know, we can try, we can believe we can, but if you're a startup, you have a few people. You have a limited amount of capital, you have a few people to go out and, and sell. So if you can work with partners who already have salespeople on the ground, who already have customer relationships, and you build an ecosystem of that whole product solution where the partner's piece along with yours gives the customer something better, those accelerate and help drive your sale. So all of these basically tell you, you know, figure out ways to lower your customer adoption risk, figure out ways to lower your market risk, figure out ways to lower your technology risk. When you do, and at each stage of that risk reduction, the value of your company grows. So a couple of thoughts on, on leadership. So when I look back in my career on the things that work for me or people I enjoyed working for are leaders who were effective. It really comes down to just these four things. These were people who are highly decisive. That meant when you had a set of issues, complex things brought in front of them, they were willing to make a decision. And I also had lots of people who were not willing to make a decision. There are people who are already go always going round and round in circles. And the reality is not making a decision is as risky as making a decision. So you're generally better off making a decision and then course correcting along the way than sitting and not doing anything at all. Uh, demanding. Yeah, we have to hold people's feet to the fire, hold them accountable for what they sign up for, their commitments. So accountability is a big deal. The ones who are effective are very demanding of the folks in the organization. But they're equally supportive. You know, that means they give you the resource, they care about you. Uh, I had bosses who are even out there on the weekend helping me tune up my car. Okay. Uh, not something I imagined or expected, but they were willing to do that because they wanted to make sure I was back the next day in time to keep working on the code. But being supportive and high integrity. You want, uh, you want to work for people who, who have high integrity. I mean, I, I was in a company once where my boss literally asked me to falsify a report that had to go back to headquarters. Okay, that's when I decided that's not a company I wanted to be part of and, and quit. But it's, it's not a good feeling to, to be around people who, who don't maintain a high level of integrity. And interestingly, you can look at your own lives, and this applies not just to, to leaders, uh, it applies to managers as well. And in fact, uh, interestingly, as I was looking at this, that description also applied to my dad. He was <laughs> extremely decisive, very demanding, but... Uh, incredibly supportive, and I can't think of a person with higher integrity. And the leader's job in that context is very easy. You have to set direction, 
which is kind of what I do. There are a lot of things you do, but when you net it out, these are the only three things that matter. You have to set a clear direction and, and strategy. You have to build the right team, because if you build the right team, the execution happens flawlessly. And you set the right tone and culture so people understand that we are really here to create value for our customers. That, and what I mean by the right tone and culture are there are a few things that matter, and it will come out in these organizational lessons. Uh, what I've learned in the large companies is management isn't about command and control. It's about coaching, supporting, investing in people. The companies where I saw that, those companies thrive. People liked working there. The retention rate was high. Turnover was low, et cetera. Systems and processes, as you grow, this is one of the unfortunate things. The larger the company, the more systems and processes because they want to make sure things are going in a disciplined way. So it helps execution discipline, but those same things stifle innovation because when you try something new, they'll say it doesn't fit with this process. So they will reject things that are actually fundamental and good for the company, but they will reject it because it doesn't fit a certain process which is why you see all of these companies going through one wave and then missing the next wave and struggling. You see that with all of the large tech companies. And culture matters. And I keep repeating this because I worked in cultures that were horrible and I decided uh, very quickly to quit them. But the things, underlying things that matter to all of us as, as humans, trust, respect, integrity, those are core human values. If they don't, if they don't exist, you'll have a very tough time in that company. And Built on top of that are what I'd call organizational behavior things, mutual accountability, teamwork, because things only happen in teams, and a sense of urgency. You can't be dawdling. Business moves very quickly. Competition is there. The customer is demanding. So, so you've got to keep the pace high. So there's got to be a sense of urgency in making decisions. There's got to be accountability so the team can perform well, and uh, then things happen. Mid-sized companies, it's a little easier. There's a lot of growth. So you see shared purpose. Everybody aligns. In larger companies, the purpose is very diffused. So it becomes very hard at junior levels to say, okay, what am I really working for? What is that greater purpose that I'm part of, and how does my little piece fit? In mid-sized and smaller companies, that's clearer. So, so you really feel your job is more fulfilling. There's accountability, high-performance teams. All the values I talked about, uh, those exist in spades in these environments. They're growing rapidly, so scaling for growth and finding the succession plan because some people can't scale the same way. So making sure that the organization is hiring people, bringing in enough strength. So as this thing is growing, that there are people who can lead those charges and take advantage of those opportunities. Small companies is quite the opposite. You have limited resources. So that means you have to be super disciplined, maniacal focus on exactly what you're doing and not let all other things distract or stray you. you know, people say, oh, well, why don't we do this? This technology will work here too. Why don't we do this? And pretty soon you're doing five versions of the same core. Pick the one and put all your energy behind it. That may look risky, but if you've really got that customer insight uh, through all the discussions, You'll be able to focus and bring razor sharp focus to that specific area that you want to focus on. Sense of urgency, you have a limited amount of capital, so more than in any of the others, making sure that you're driving this engine fast. Because the sooner you can get to real product and real revenues, the less you have to depend on investors and the more the customers are paying your bills. And as I mentioned earlier, scaling the business requires a robust partner ecosystem. So tie those in. And lastly, the lesson that's common to all of them is the customer is the only sustainable part of, of source of our paychecks. Everybody in a company gets a paycheck, a salary. That comes from the customer. Initially, in the beginning, it may come from investors, but investors don't stick with you forever. Uh, they stick only till they see growth. If they don't, they'll eventually get off. But if you have good customers and you keep building the business, there's a constant flow of income that then supports the entire organization. So never forget the customer. So your life in the technology lane, what does that mean? So I talked, it's more than technology. Most of us spend four or five years uh, or even more if you do a master's uh, in the technology sector. And for us, and definitely for me, it was the be all end all. You know, 
but when you go to the real world you find that it's only a piece of it it's it's a lot more than technology the the customer makes a huge difference communications learning to work with each other talk to each other ask questions uh, in a constructive way it's not to ask questions to put the other person down but to really to understand so that collectively we can come up with better solutions that's really key and that third collectively is about collaboration because good teams create good products and the last one is in specific to a company or a business it's really about all of you it's definitely something I did not do early part of my career and realized much later that it was important and that's networking and networking doesn't mean reaching out to your friends only when you're in trouble or when you have a need networking is about staying in touch with the people you meet at IIT or in a work setting on an ongoing basis so you can tap them for help support when you need it down the road but you've built and collectively I mean built a relationship over a long period of time. We don't do this enough. Uh, we don't, we're not taught to do this. Uh, we don't realize it's important. And I definitely didn't realize it was important for probably the first 10, 15 years of my career. It was only later that I realized how important this was and started building relationships. Uh, but that's a very key part of being successful in your career. And then what, what does your career mean? And number one, we all talk about dreams and passion and excitement. Are you, you have to ask yourself, you know, what excites you? What field, what technology, business, venture, whatever, what, what excites you? You want to be aligned with that. And if the answer is only around that question, you're a spectator. I mean, I can get very excited about uh, World Cup soccer. I have zero skills for it, but I watched every game uh, on TV so then you're a spectator if you tie what you're excited by with what your skills are skills you can develop now you have something to work with you can apply that towards your passion or your excitement and if you have those two you have a hobby you're good at something you're excited by something you spend a lot of time on it but the next two really determine whether you really have a career or these same questions apply to a business as well. Is there a need? If, is what you're doing, does it matter to somebody? Is there a need to a customer, to a person, etc.? And if you do, then there's some meaning to all of this thing that excites you where you have the skills. And lastly, is somebody willing to pay for it? And that somebody could be a, a research grant, it could be a venture capitalist, it could be a customer. But somebody has to pay for it, because if you have the first three and you don't have anybody paying for it, it's a problem. So as an example, uh, there were, I mean, we had, we have malaria in spades, right? But a lot of malaria uh, affects the less developed countries. So there's not a lot of money there. People aren't willing to pay for the drugs, etc. So research doesn't happen. Nobody's willing to pay for that. So until the Gates Foundation came in and said, we're going to fund this, the kind of research into that just wasn't happening. Even though there were people who are passionate about solving this problem, people who had the skills to do it, you knew there's a huge need for it in the marketplace, but it took that fourth one, somebody to fund it, to make all of those. So you need all four of these to really make something viable. So your career purpose or your business purpose, ask yourself these four questions. Do all of these tie in? And then you have a purpose. Otherwise, it's just an exciting hobby. And lastly, none of this matters unless you're having fun. In my first job at HP, I had a general manager who would always ask this at every group meeting, are we having fun yet? And, and I didn't realize it then. I thought it was one of those uh, cliches uh, that he was just using. But looking back, uh, one of the things that's been wonderful for me is I've had fun all along because I was in a field that I loved and I've had very interesting problems to, to solve. So all of us at IIT, we're good problem solvers. Uh, regardless of engineering discipline, if you take away the engineering label, what we learn is how to solve problems. What we learn is how to deal with pressure. Uh, and those are things that are just part of our everyday life for the four, five, six, however many years you spend here. So is the, and interestingly, this becomes part of your core because if the problem is not challenging, 
you're sitting there going, God, I'm bored. And so that's the counter side. So if you don't want to be bored, you want something that's challenging and interesting. And is there an opportunity to learn and grow? Because we're all, we're built that way. We're we just naturally built that way. And if you're not learning and growing, it becomes boring. And then it takes the fun out of the job. And then the people you're working with, every day you've got to go in and spend time with a bunch of people around you. So are their personalities clicking? Do they follow the, have the same cultural mindset, etc.? Do you like working for your boss? Is he or she a jerk? Or are they supportive, demanding, and somebody who can help you be successful, help the company be successful? And is it a high performance culture? And I bring this back again because if there's one thing I've learned over the many years, uh, the culture of the organization is, is a huge, has a huge impact on the success of that organization. It's back to those human values, trust, respect, integrity that we all care about. And it's those organization values around speed, accountability, teamwork. And everywhere those have checked out right, I've had fun. And everywhere any one of those has checked out wrong, I've not had fun. And if you have fun, it doesn't feel like work, right? Keep enjoying yourself and you never work a day as long as you're having fun. So that's my philosophy in life. The technology career is a roller coaster. It has lots of twists and turns along the way and you go through these waves. But it's exhilarating and it's fun. All of you came into IIT, some because you wanted to, some because your parents told you to. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're all great problem solvers. You're all great at handling pressure. And if you take those skills and apply it to the real world and check yourself against these questions that I just laid out for you, you'll have fun in your careers. So with that, uh, I'll open it up for any questions you have. Yeah, so um, you talked about having fun and you said about the opportunities to learn and grow. Now, success is also a big part of the equation. So, I feel that like, have you have you ever come across a position where you you, you have a you have a challenge out in front of you, but the question as to whether you'll be successful in that particular challenge is still open. But there exists another path where you know you'll be successful. And how do you choose between success and a challenging problem, and um, a challenging problem without knowing whether you'll be successful in it or or, or, or not? So. So it's a great question, and, and a lot of that depends on how you define success. Do you su define success in the context of power, position, money, or do you define success in the context of fun and things like that? So I'll give you an example, and I actually faced that choice. I was uh, at Adaptech in the mid-90s. I was a successful corporate executive uh, with a large organization. I was running a $400 million business. The company was growing, uh, and so I could have stayed there and continued to be successful. And in fact, I had a five-year growth ride that was phenomenal. I joined when the company was 160 million by in 93. By 98, it was a billion-dollar company. I got lots of opportunities, lots of learning, lots of challenges. And I got promoted. Uh, I started with a 90 million dollar business. I was able to start some new things within that. Four years later, it was 400 million. My boss was happy, everybody was happy, uh, but I could have continued that. Recruiter called me about a job in a startup, and it was a telecom startup. Now, the internet, the, the fibers were getting installed, new bandwidth was coming in, the world was going to change from voice-based technologies to IP-based over time. Brand new opportunity about something I knew nothing about, because all my past history was in computing and storage and things like that. I looked at this as I'm going into an industry I know nothing about, so it's a great opportunity to learn. I'm going into a CEO role, which will be a personal challenge because it's the next step of my career. I don't know if I'll be successful in it or not. And I'll be giving up a good paycheck. I literally took a paycheck that was half the size of my Adaptech paycheck with a lot of equity because the point was I was taking risk on the upside. If the company didn't do well, the equity would be worth nothing and I would have taken a bad financial decision. So, so I went through that, I actually made the jump. Because to me, it was uh, the thought of being in a monotonous coasting job versus doing something exciting 
doing something exciting trumped it. Okay. There's a phase in your life where money matters. You know, if your if your base income needs to be, you know, I'll just pick a number, needs to be say fifty thousand to just have a decent life, and you're making twenty five, you're going to chase that uh, fifty thousand dollar job regardless of what pressures and whether it's fun or not because you need to provide for your family. But if you now have an opportunity at hundred. Uh, it's well past your base comfort level, etc. Then the choices aren't really about the money. It's really about where's the learning, where's the fun, where's the excitement. Now, I was fortunate that in pretty much all the cases, I was able to make choices based on the fun quotient. Uh, but sometimes you do have those other issues. Right? Now, there were times when the financial pressures prevented me from making that leap, meaning that as much as I was interested in startups, I couldn't have done it in 1991 or 92 when my kids were very young and I didn't want to destabilize the family, et cetera. When, when they were a little older and I had a little better financial cushion, I was willing to make that change. But the change was in the context of, am I going to be in a coasting role running a $400 million business where I've got the basic systems and processes established or am I going to do something new? And I took that leap and I'll tell you, those next four years were an incredible amount of fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. We went from six people in the company to 200 people. We went from zero revenues to 30 million in revenues. And all of that was an exhilarating ride. And then the market crashed in 2001. I mean, in 2000 uh, for the general NASDAQ and 2001 for the telecom industry. In 2001, my revenues dropped. And I was forced, and by then, because telecom was now a bad name in the industry because of the market crash, all the VC, venture capitalists pulled back. That meant I didn't have new money coming in to continue funding the growth of the company. So we were forced to sell the company at that point to a company called Paradigm, and then, which later became part of Zone. But in that process, the equity return wasn't as great. So if I look back and say, financially, would I have been better off at Adaptech? Absolutely. But if I look back and look at, did I have fun on that journey? Absolutely. And I would do it again today. Those four years, that team we built, even today we get together, a phenomenal team. The team executed. I had some superb people working for me. Some of them came back, worked for me in other companies later. Uh, but I would never trade that experience. So, so it's, it's a matter of how you define success. And to me, success was a definition around fun is do I, do I you know, it's again, is the opportunity challenging? Will I learn something? Will I enjoy working with the people around me, which means you know, my peers and my boss? And is the culture solid? Now, when you're CEO, then you have the opportunity to establish that culture and set that tone. So you have a little more freedom. But if you don't, then you at least look for that. It's a fairly long answer, sorry, but you, know, you can't make that trade off. It's all a definition of success. But don't define, frankly, don't, def, don't ever define success in the context of money. Money is merely a scorecard. All the other things will get you the money if you execute right. No. No, that's, that's a great question. You, you can't change constantly. You need to build, you need to be in a place long enough to get a foundation set of skills that are applicable. Okay, you're, you're right. You can't change every two years because then pretty, uh, after a while people say, okay, uh, what's your foundation? Right. Uh, but you can change in, in periods of time. So if you look at uh, the valley technology waves of every 10 years, you know, if you change every five odd, that's okay. If you change every one or two, that's a problem because then you're not building a foundation skill set. And by the way, you don't have to change. I mean, even within a particular domain, you can find lots of challenging opportunities, right? So the key is uh, define things in the context of challenge and uh, learning. It can still happen within the same domain if that domain is growing and changing within itself. Uh, like, what are the challenges uh, you observed uh, in doing the teamwork? Like, when it, when it comes to teamwork, there are always the ego issues, and most yeah. of the time, it happens like, We'll uh, lo lose the fund because of that, rather than on the work, actually. Right. 
So, so it, it, it's a great question, and uh, again, this depends on what your position is and where you are in the organization. And this is something you have to test. Uh, as a CEO, when I hire people, one of the things I say is, it, it's a it's a paradox, because as an individual, you want people who are driven and ambitious, and by definition, if you're driven and ambitious, you have an ego about you. And it's an important part of what makes you. At the same time, to your point, when you have collaboration and interaction, those egos get in the way. So one of the first things I say to people when I'm interviewing them or when I'm hiring them is, when you walk in, the, you know, it's good that you have an ego to be driven and to achieve something. But when you walk in that room, you check your ego at the door. That the, the purpose is about making the company successful. Uh, you know, that will naturally make the individual successful, not the other way around. Right? When the individuals try to be successful, they, they often work at cross purposes and then the company fails. You know, one of the best examples I saw of that was actually at Adaptec. When I joined, uh, there was a very firm, strong CEO who had established a culture. It was remarkable. I would sit in the room with the division GMs of the other divisions, and while everybody was actually held accountable to grow their business and be successful, when we met in that room, we'd all talk about what are the trade-offs to make the company successful. That means if I had to cut my R&D budget so we could spend R&D on that other division's budget, which would overall help the company better, I'd be prepared to do it, and likewise, the other person would be prepared to do it. That's the kind of expectation the CEO set. And if people did not behave that way, they didn't last long in that company. So a very key part of this is making sure that the egos are managed. And as the leader, you can do that. Now, when you are joining a company, you got to ask yourself that. Uh, is I, what is that culture? Is, is that being fostered from the top? Is the dynamics of your department or team? Is your manager fostering that? Are you seeing a lot of political backbiting and things like that? And if you're seeing a lot of egos and politics and uh, optimizing around personal gain versus the department or company gain, wrong place to be. Uh, you won't have fun. Right. And you can't change that. I mean, the, it, if, if the message isn't from the top, you cannot change that. Good evening, sir. Uh, so, what do you see as the difference uh, in uh, starting in in uh, starting a company between India and uh, US? Like, what do you see as the market dynamics over here? So, I'm probably not the most qualified to answer that because I've never started anything here. Uh, but I'll give you at least my perspectives, and people here may have some thoughts on it as well. Uh, one, what little I know. Venture capitalists here don't take the same risk that venture capitalists in, in the US do. So the US venture capitalists tend to put capital much earlier. Here, people seem to want to take a lot more of the risk out. So, so the risk profile of venture capitalists here is much lower. Okay. There, they'll fund an idea. And even there, it's changing, by the way. Uh, they're, less, they're becoming more like Indian venture capitalists in that sense. Uh, in that they want to see some progress on your prototype, some validation with customers before they're willing to put money in. You know, Ten years ago, they'd put money in just on the idea and the team. Okay, so that's one difference. The, the other difference is uh, India has a huge number of opportunities in the business to consumer sector. Uh, because there's a thriving middle class and we have an economy that's growing uh, faster than a lot of parts of the world, uh, there are opportunities here that aren't just in technology. You know, the, the U.S. industry is much more mature, so a lot of the startups and ideas are around the technology sector or around healthcare, biotech, etc. Whereas here, you have opportunities in, in retail, you have opportunities in uh, real estate, you have, you have opportunities in anything you can think of because uh, there's a lot of uh, fertile ground, gre green fields, if you will. So in that sense, the venture capitalists here are funding opportunities not just in technology. Now, what folks here can do when you look at opportunities in India is tie that in. Now, how can you 
use technology to enable products and services to consumers, etc. Um, so, I mean, you, you have some wonderful examples here on the B2C side, uh, people like Flipkart and Snapdeal, etc. Uh, there are lots of others because uh, everything that has been tried or done in the US in a different way can be done here or there will be opportunities here that somebody in the US won't even think of because the problems here are very different. So, so your problem space is much wider here, much wider here because it uh, is a growing economy with starting from a very different base. So, you do not have to feel restricted to say uh, the startup idea I have is only around uh, my engineering field. It, it, it could be anything if you if you are, get a bunch of people together and you come up with some bright ideas, you can go try it out and, and get it funded. And the market is huge, right? Uh, that's one of the advantages. It, the U.S., India, China, all three have large enough domestic markets that you can build a business. You can create an idea, build a business, just focus on that market. You don't have to think about international expansion and all the complications associated with that. Now, later you can go do that as well, but as a starting point, you have critical mass. Now, those are the high level differences I know, but I have not you know, lived and worked here or raised capital here to say uh, more than that. So, I hope that helps. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so, thanks a lot for this very interesting lecture of yours, sir. And thanks for walking through your life story and uh, giving us some glim glimpses of how you faced your challenges. So now I pr now I welcome uh, Rohit, the S Secretary of INAR, to present a momentos to Mr. Sundaresh, sir.